Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Wilmoth, and I'm here with my partner, Sean King. And today we are honored to have uh, Mike Coltrane, former professional player, hustler, jack of all trades. Mike, uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Really? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a it's a honor to meet you, and I can't wait to to see what we learn today. Cool. So you know, I, I sent you a, a few of the questions we'd like to ask, but I mean, this is all this this is all about storytelling. This is this is about your history with pool, um, and you know how you got started, and then of course we we want to know you know why what what put you out of the game. You know. Okay. Um so where'd you where'd you grow up at? So I was gonna say, do you do you mind, do you mind me so I'll go ahead and give uh the audience here a little bit of background as far as my all my accolades, uh, you know, what where I started and you know, pretty much where I ended as far as my professional career. So those who maybe are gonna watch this and don't know of me or have heard of me or haven't heard of me. My name is Michael Coltrane, like you said. My nickname was The Train. They used to blow a whistle uh, at the uh, at the professional tournaments whenever I would play a match. Uh, I started playing the pool when I was four. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina, born and raised. Started playing when I was four. Uh, when I was on eight, I was on TV. Uh, the local news channel filmed me running all 15 balls off the table. And then when I was uh, 14, I decided to play in the BCA Junior National Championship. I was able to go to Louisville, Kentucky, which is where I'm going for the Derby and uh, coming up here in a few weeks. And I actually was able to win that. That was a very unique experience, Chris. I'll be honest with you. I, you know, as a 14 year old kid, kid, you know, when you're playing, you know, locally in your home pool room, you know, you, you like at that age, I knew I could play, right? Like I knew I had talent. I, I, I could tell, you know, I had a raw ability and I, you know, it was something that, hey, I might want to pursue this you know, professionally. You know, I, I basically, from the age of eight, when I was on TV, I took like about around age nine, I went through that that development of where I was just like, nah, I pull, I want to play baseball, basketball, and football. And I dove in head deep into those sports. And then when I was 13, my dad was just driving by a pool room. And he's like, hey, you want to shoot a game in pool? And it was kind of like, I just had never thought about playing pool again. And as my dad would tell the story, which he's still alive today, he's 77, he's still alive, bless his heart. But uh, he's told the story a thousand times. We drove up the pool room, and the way he remembers it, kind of like I remember, like literally I grabbed a kill off the wall, guys, and it was almost like I had never quit from when I was eight. Like I was, I was, you know, within an hour I was running racks. You know what I mean? It was kind of like weird. So obviously when I left the pool room that day, I was like, hey, Pop, like, can we play again? You know what I mean? Like, where's, where's, where's the pool room at? Because we just had went by this random place. So then we found, like, the, the actual pool room uh, where all the players went in Raleigh called Brass Tap and Billiards. It's kind of a, a famous spot, long, you know, back in the day in the 90s, early 2000s, a lot of gambling, a lot of tournaments. It's where Johnny Archer lived. Uh, so anyway, so I, I went to Louisville when I was 14. Won the junior nationals, uh, you know, went up there, like I said, just not knowing really how I how I stood amongst, you know, my age. And, you know, I was able to win that tournament. So I was uh, I kind of realized, okay, I'm obviously really good. I played, I don't know, 50 or 60, you know, kids my age. Uh, and I went undefeated. So, I mean, I'm not going to say, like, you know, I just breathed through it. I had a lot of tough matches, but. I got home, you know, that that trophy kind of like made me think, okay, this is something I did definitely want to do for a living. And I went back and won. Uh, the BCA has a, I don't know if they still have it, but they have a 14 under division and a 15 through 18 division. So I went back uh, 15 or, or 16, I might have skipped a year. I went back and won it again. And I was the first two time winner, for first winner to win each division. I think Jesse Bowman. And a couple others have done it since then, but I was the first one to ever win both divisions of the BCA. So anyway, I, you know, uh, right out of high school, I just, you know, as soon as high school was over, I'm like head first in the pool, started traveling that summer and turned professional immediately. And a lot of it came from Johnny, Chris, to be honest with you, uh, Sean, like Johnny Archer was my 
was basically my mentor. You know, he moved to Raleigh. I kind of, I kind of hit the lottery when it comes to uh, my mentor, Johnny, he had, you know, he come to a couple of tournaments uh, there in Raleigh that, that we had and we, me and him hit it off right away, but he met a girl there and ended up, ended up marrying her. So when he got married and moved there full time, like it was like, I hit the lottery. I mean, I was literally like, he would call me up and, you know, I might be off goofing around with my friends doing, you know, what, you know, a, a 16, 17, 18 year old kid would do. And he's like, get your ass to the pool room. You know what I mean? Like, let's, let's play. So I was like his sparring partner. And, and, you know, from there, he just urged me really hard to follow the professional route, like go the professional tournament route, you know, like obviously get out there and gamble and get out there and hit the road and, but keep your nose clean, keep your head, you know, head high, do the right thing. And that's, that's where I've always lived my life. I've always, that's when my dad raised me. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of stories back in the day. Obviously, you know, when you when you go in a pool room or you show up at a town or a tournament with a certain individual, you know, you get, you know, people have their whatever they want to say. But at the end of the day, I'm very proud to say I kept my nose clean. I, I, I feel like I kept a very good reputation for myself. Uh, and I just I, I, I just I, I played hard. What my dad instilled in me when I was a kid to pretty much always when you start something, always finish it. And, you know, if you're going to do something, do it right. I remember he built me, and this has a lot to do with my success in pool. It's funny how when you, especially when you get older, now I tell the story, but I kind of, I didn't realize it maybe at the time, but I was, I was big into skating, guys. And I was like, you know, I had, when I had that like six month span where I was just all about, you know, having, you know, a skateboard and wanting to skate. And I'll tell you this story, and I hope everybody here that watches this understands this story how, you know, as a parent, if you have kids, how doing something, one one small thing I like what my dad did can really just spiral for the next 20 years. So he built this skateboard ramp for me. My dad's a carpenter, and he started building this ramp for me. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment in Raleigh. And I remember, guys, I'll never forget, like, you know, I'm a, I was like a 12, 13-year-old kid, right? And I'm just dying to get on the, the, the ramp. You know, like I see him building the ramp. And I'm just dying to get on the ramp. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm anxious, right? I'm 12, I'm 13 years old. And my father literally like, wait, like, like the night would, the night would fall. I would, I'm like, come on, pop, come on. He's like, it ain't ready. It ain't ready. And the point of the story is guys, he literally probably spent three or four extra days to really like make it 100% the way he wanted it to make it right. You know what I mean? And, and, and I had to wait, I had to patiently wait. But when it was done, it was done right. And, you know, it was kind of like it was said without being said, hey, when you do something, you're going to do it the right way and you're going to go all in. There's no other, you're not holding back. You know, if we're going to be out there till dark, I mean, he was out there till dark every night building that ramp. So it's funny how that one little, I remember as a kid watching him do that and it bothered the crap out of me, right? Like, because I was dying to skate, but I watched and I remember thinking, okay, that's how I got. That's if I'm, if I'm doing anything, I got to do it just like he did. I, I, I got to do it until I can perfect it. Cause he literally had to make everything. He was like, you know, trying to, I mean, he never built a skate ramp before. Right. So anyway, that quick little story that had a lot to do with, with my work ethic when it came to pool. Uh, because when I would go practice, I mean, I was just, I, I became kind of a, a perfectionist, you know what I mean? So, and that, Crazy is enough that one story about my dad with that skateboard ramp had a lot to do with uh with my perfection and and just my work ethic and putting in the hours and and days and years and I think that's what led me to being the player I became. So what what year did you finish high school? Uh, ninety four. Yep, yep. Jumped right in the summer of ninety four. Right into I drove out to Phoenix, Arizona. I spent the whole summer in Phoenix and LA and, and San Francisco. And a guy took me out there and said, Hey, you're going to play $20 nine ball to your, to your arm falls off. And that's what I, that's what I did. I played $20 nine ball to my arm fell off in the, in the whole Phoenix, Mesa, Arizona area. So when you, um, when you, when you turned pro, who were, who were some of your sponsors? Uh, well, so I didn't have any sponsors, you know, when I, when I joined the tour, it was called the, the professional beers tour with Don Mackey. Uh, this is when pool was 
was as you know for your historians like you said you are Chris this is when pool was starting to see a rise mm -hmm. and I don't even even though I was there I was so young I don't really remember exactly what caused it to just like overnight go from we started being on ESPN the guys the men and you know uh, ESPN wanted to take pro beard you know, the Pro Bears tour and do something with it to all of a sudden there's no tour, there's no Don Mackey and there's no TV. Well, it's, and because, then it's, like, it's because somebody sued the tobacco companies, you know, okay. and okay. so they were not allowed to, tobacco companies couldn't, couldn't advertise on TV and could not sponsor big events. So when that happened and Camel pulled their, they had to pull their sponsorship. Okay, so now I'm not trying to obviously I'm not sure, but I'm not trying to say like I'm not trying to get the story twisted. I'm not trying to say you're right or wrong because I honestly don't remember to a degree. But the Camel series was after the Pro Breeder series. It was ran by different people. We had we did have a Camel series. Okay, so I this this tour was actually called the the Professional Beards Tour. Like actually, so I so I have a YouTube video. Uh, up uh, of me playing Danny Medina, mm -hmm. and uh, the 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 there's a there's a, a logo in the background mm -hmm. uh, of the Pro Beards tour that was ran by Don Mackey. We had an actual commissioner like like the NFL does, uh, you know, and Don Mackey was our commissioner. And my my point is because I I really don't remember exactly what happened, but we literally overnight it wasn't even like that. See, Camel ran for about four years. And then they just pulled their sponsorship and might have something to do with, or, or we can never get on TV maybe because of the, you know, of the, uh, the, the, the tobacco stuff that you're referring to, you know, the, 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 the four years of the camel tour, uh, 96, 97, 8, 99. Yeah. The four years, that's where I basically started really diving into becoming the best professional I could be. Uh, and that's where my rise and, and my, my dedication to, uh, professional tournament pool really took off, but the professional beards tour, which was ran a little bit different, like you, it was like the point system was different. Like it was almost like you when you got to one turn. I just I, I just remember Johnny saying, make sure you get to every tournament no matter what it takes. So I was basically out Texas, Oklahoma. I was out traveling the the whole country, the whole you know. I was just on the road nonstop, and I was doing whatever I could do. To I, I think it was I think I just basically had to, had to pay my way. It wasn't like you had to, you know, you had to be like a a member of the tour. Anybody could just walk up and pay their money. It was more or less a be there, pay because I think the pro beers tour the way they did. It, if you earned a certain amount of points, the following year you were allowed to play in every tournament. I honestly I forgot exactly how it was ran, but I do remember that's where it started uh, with me chasing my professional tour career and then like i said it kind of crashed and then like you were talking about with this cigarettes camel came along and i remember getting the news from johnny hey man we got this new sponsor they're going to try to take pool and do what they do with nascar so they had the winston cup series mm -hmm. and they came we had the world championships in greensboro that year and or winston salem actually so right in their backyard and they came out and watched the tournament. And it was, I forgot who put on the tournament. It wasn't, it might even, might even been by the Pro Beers Tour. So there's possibly a connection there where Camel took it over, but the Pro Beers Tour and Don Mackey didn't, you know, they didn't have nothing to do with, as far as I can remember, with the Camel Beard series. I, I could be wrong. So let's don't, I, I'm not, it's been a few years, but uh, I do remember the Camel Beard, Camel Beard series being different than the Pro Beards Tour, you know what I mean? So, but anyway, they, they, they witnessed that world championship. Johnny actually won that championship. Uh, and then they decided to sponsor us. And then, you know, they, they did like a, a like they did with NASCAR. They had every year there was points you earned. And like, you know, like the tournament that I went to there in Magoo's where if you finished in top 24, you got paid X amount of dollars. And they paid kind of every tournament. It was 96 players. Top 24 got paid. And so they did like a eight or 10 tournament series for the year. And the top 24 at the end of the year, we had a banquet and the top 24 got paid 
you know, X amount of dollars. And I remember I finished, I think I finished like 12th the first year. No, no, I'm sorry. I finished like 14th, somewhere in the mid-teens the first year, 12th the second year, 97. And then I made it my goal, which was my goal the second year, but I made it, I made it like my definite goal in 98, 98 to finish top 10. I finished 10th. And then that year, Dennis Hatch was one, one of my good friends. He finished second, and he was like, next year's your year. And I started at Olathe, Kansas was the first tournament in 99. And, and the way they did the points, this I remember, the way they did the, the points on the Camel Series is we had eight or ten tournaments. And basically the first tournament, however you finished, now you're, you're, that, you're that ranking. And basically – uh, you know, the points were allocated every tournament after that. So I finished fourth at that tournament and I pretty much stayed there around the fourth like ranking all year. I was eking around. Actually, you know, Chris at Magoo's, I was eking around. I came in, I was in the, I was in the loser's bracket. I was playing really well. And I remember that was, that was, there was one more tournament in Denver after that. That was the tournament before the last term of the year. And if I had won, I think I finished third or fourth at that tournament, Magoo's. If I had won that tournament, I would have been the driver's seat to win the whole thing. But it, the points were so close that I think Bustamani ends up winning that tournament at Magoo's. And then, uh, anyway, I started fourth and I finished fourth. So it was kind of ironic. And I was voted at the banquet that we they, they did like uh, – they gave away like a player's choice award and the players voted me the most consistent player all year. I basically like every tournament, I was pretty much right there. Uh, I finished second at one of the events. Uh, but I would, I would, I'll be honest with you guys in 99, that was my best professional career. I was a tough out. Like I was just a guy that personally, I remember looking at the board and, you know, I didn't really look at guys names no more. I just told myself they had to play me. I wasn't worried who I had to play. I know if I came and played my game, uh, I was going to be a tough out for anybody. It was race to nine, race to 11, whatever the term format was. And I knew my game was good enough to beat anybody at that time of my career, a race to nine or race to 11. I could, I could be anybody. So, you know, when you change that mindset, which we can get into here in a minute, you know, that was a big, a big shift in my career, changing my mindset of knowing that, Hey, this isn't, I'm not playing like a, you know, a 50 ahead here. Right? I'm not playing a race to a hundred against Earl and Efren, right? Like I knew kind of my plates. I knew like where I thought I stood, you know, as far as I knew I wasn't the best. I knew I wasn't better than Johnny or better than Efren. I respected my, you know, the guys that were the best at the time, but I knew on any given day I could beat them, all of them. I could beat them all in a row. I mean, I, like I didn't think I couldn't win a tournament. It was it was never uh, around '98 is when I started believing that I could win any, any event that I you know entered entered or put my name in the hat in. What a feeling! What a feeling that's got to be. Um, yes, to, to know that you can you can win in the events that you're going to. Well, if you don't think you can win, then why show up? <laughs> I mean, why do 450 people sign up for one event at the Derby? I mean, you're, you're right. Just some of them do it just to play, Sean. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I mean, I agree with you, buddy. If you don't, if you don't, if you honestly don't believe, and listen, pool, for anybody that's listening to this, I want, I want you to understand something. Pool is 80%, if not more, mental than anything. I mean, it literally is mental. We all have ability, like you said, Sean, you know, you're ranking in the Fargo, you know, so. I could talk to you away from this and probably tell you some things of why you never became the player you wanted to become. It was all up here. I promise you. I mean, cause at the end of the day, if you go look at my actual like uh, videos, there's two of them on YouTube. Uh, one against Ralph. There's, there's a couple of the Moscone cups, my actual natural like stroke and my natural like ball making ability. I had like a, a, a you know, a very, you know, unique, like it came, it, it wasn't like perfect and pretty like Suke or Johnny, you know, so so my point is like my actual 
I had a lot of natural talent when it came to pocketing balls as a young kid. But as I got older, my my, my stance, you know, it wasn't it was it, it was what felt good, but it wasn't like the the correct stance. And I would tell anybody, once again, who's listening, so many people get in the the, the mindset of is my stance right? Is, is is my bridge right? Listen, forget all that. It's kind of like a golf swing. Like, who cares how your golf swing is? How do you make contact with the ball? So at the end of the day, it's all about making contact with the ball. And it's all about the mindset you have on that table. And my mindset got to where if you missed, you're in trouble. Like, that's just, I mean, I, that's just, I, I got to where I believe that I would sit in that chair and I would hop out of that chair if you missed. Like, I remember I would just wait for you to miss. I was dying for an opportunity because I knew that, you know, I was playing the table. I wasn't playing you. I wasn't playing the person. I was. It was just me and the table. And that came from practice. That came from, you know, just practicing, uh, doing some things uh, behind closed doors that pretty much mentally I would put myself in that position. Like, I visualize a lot, put myself in those uh, tournament situations uh, you know, with with the lights and the cameras. So when I got in the lights and the cameras, I'd already mentally put myself there. I had practiced it mentally. So I was kind of ready for that moment. Wow. Well, the middle game is, is um, it's basically all I study anymore for pool and anything you can share with us uh, that will help, help me and help our viewers uh, with their game. <laughs> Man, I mean that—that's—that's that's the juice right there. That's what we're looking for. Is, well, is... Sean, that's easy. So I've actually debated about doing a pool course. You know, we were, Chris, you we were talking about podcasts. You know, being popular now. I've been debating about doing a pool course. I actually started doing a pool course, and just honestly, not trying to, not trying to basically. I forgot the word for it. Why I'm basically uh, knocking myself here for saying how my dad raised me to finish stuff. As I got older, that's how I haven't been as good as I was during my youth at finishing things. But my whole pool course, my whole people ask me all the time, hey, give me lessons. Hey, you know, and, and I've given a couple lessons here or there, guys. Like, but I'll be honest with you. I can do more for you, Chris, spending an hour or two on the phone with you once a month, probably three, four times and telling you to do certain things and we and we talking again than me actually meeting you at the pool room and we pl us playing or me showing you things on the table. I mean, at the end of the day, it literally is all right here that separates Alex, Shane, Efren, Johnny from everybody else. People don't believe that. They look at how they play, but I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I pretty much got to that level. Uh, I was right there. So I know what it takes to get there. Uh, and I know what they do. And I kind of learned by either a watching or talking or getting the information from them that, you know, it was not to be, it's kind of like a player's code. You know what I mean? You just don't tell. So there's a like, like there's kind of like a level of like the top guys, right? And there's that little notch below, and then you got all, like, I do call them, Sean, like shortstops, like the guys that just come to all the tournaments. And you just know that they're going to be a tough out, but they're really not a threat to ever win. And if they ever, like, make it to the final, you know, full or whatever, they're probably going to dog it, right? You know, you got that group of guys. And then, like I said, you got a group that's right underneath the top notch guys that could easily win the tournament. And you got to make sure you're, you're definitely on your A game. I was pretty much right there. Like, I was – you know, Johnny used to always tell me, you know, like I was feared by I was right. Like I was right there. I was I was so close to being right there with them. I was I was as close of a level as you could get to being a Johnny or Earl or, or an Efren. And then we'll discuss it here in a minute. What happened to me with my arm that pretty much had me, you know, have to give up pool. But back to your question, Sean, about the mental aspect. Pool is so so mental to where when I when I when I train I mean I, I've done quite a bit of training actually uh, since you know the internet came along and you know just technology right so and I've you know I, I I do it now so if anybody that's watching wants to reach out to me on Facebook uh, feel free I, I I would love to help people uh, so 
I would tell you without giving away all my nuts and bolts, I would tell you that when you, one of the biggest things for me was starting to visualize kind of like a uh, picture being, if you love basketball, you love baseball, right? Or you love football, whatever sport you, you love, Tom Brady. Uh, so basically here's what, here's what I tell my clients or anybody I've ever worked with. I promise you the Tom Brady's, the Tiger Woods, those guys, when they're hitting balls, when they're, you know, throwing football passes or they're shooting free throws by themselves. What they're really doing is they're shooting free throws, hitting those golf shots like Tiger. But Tiger, when Tiger's hitting those golf shots, he's mentally putting himself wherever he might be in his backyard. He might be on his home course in, in shorts and shoes, right? But he's mentally at the Masters on 18. Like he's put him, putting him – his. so he's, he's over that shot but he's visualizing everything around him being the crowd, the noise. He's, he's, he's mentally putting himself in that arena. So what I would do is I used to play the ghost and I used to not play the ghost at my home pool room. I used to go to another pool room behind where nobody could, you know, watch me do it. And I would play the ghost and I would mentally put myself at the U S open. Cause I was like my favorite. I was like my one place I wanted to be. U.S. Open, the main arena, playing Johnny. Every time playing Johnny, right? Or playing Efren, a couple of times playing Efren. So I would play the ghost. And as I'm playing the ghost, I'm mentally not playing the ghost, guys. I'm playing Johnny. I'm playing Efren. And I'm mentally not in, it was called Browns Billiards, was one of the places I went to in Raleigh. I wasn't in Browns. And so as crazy as it sounds, man, I'm going to be honest with you. I literally would have people come up to me and be like, Michael, Michael. And I'm like, what? And literally, like, I I don't know this might sound like crazy. Like, I'm not trying to say I was hypnotized, but I had literally, I thought I was there. So, like, they like they would tap me on my shoulder. And I'm on that table, and I had forgot. I, I, did, I, I couldn't, my surroundings were gone. The surroundings in my head were the crowd, the lights, the camera. You know, like, it was all that. So, that's what those guys do. That's what Tom Brady. That's what. That's why Tom Brady's one of the best. I know it. I've read his book. Like that's. I mean, that's the secret. The secret sauce, as you call it, Sean. Uh, you know, but just because you visualize and you practice, doesn't mean you'll execute. But I'm just saying that is one of the keys to becoming somebody who executes versus somebody who can't execute. You know, when I was traveling, all my years of playing professional pool. And even, even today, I might run into a pool room. Occasionally, I'll get asked, hey, can you show me this or show me a shot? And I'll tell you the number one thing I, I, I used to always get, guys, everywhere I went, right, from some just amateur, right, some like, I don't know, like a four or five playing APA, right? Hey, Michael, show me what I do here. And I would literally say, okay, uh, you want to hit it right here on this, on, you know, we want to cut it down the rail. And Every time, guy, right? ninety-nine out of a hundred. You know the result. Dan tried to get back. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Why not? So my point is, their immediate answer is I can't. So if you think you can't, then you, like you're 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 toast. Like you like like. So I would I, I I would ask the person like, have you ever made that shot before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just a tough shot. I know. But have you made it before? Yes. And that's the beautiful thing about pool, guys, right? Pools, unlike golf or football or, well, football probably, but that's golf. A lot of people that play pool play a lot of golf. They're, you'll never, ever, ever hit the same shot playing golf. And it's kind of like a, a known thing or like it's hard. Like if you play golf, you'll never hit the same exact shot twice. But in pool, you will 100% shoot the same shot a bunch, like a hundreds and hundreds of times, you'll have the exact same shot, the exact same, the balls are landing the exact same way. And so my point is, when you get to a certain level like you were at, Sean, right? And, you know, shortstop, decent player. When you get to where you can run four, five, six balls, anybody listen? Or if you can run a rack, you can play the ghost. You can take ball in hand from the one and run out. Guys, if you can do that, there's no stopping you. If you can do that, do you have no excuse? That's just the end up. That's just. But the difference is, everybody who gets to that level, like you were at Sean, 
you mentally think you can't get there. You're already like just mentally, oh, I can't beat Shan Van Bonen. I can't beat Alex. Well, guess what? You already you already beat. You mentally don't think you can, even though you know you play good, but you mentally just don't think you will ever get that good. But in all reality, you can. You just mentally didn't believe you could. So if you would have practiced in the back room, if you got hold of me when you were playing, and I would have put you in the back room, and I would have talked to you every single week, I'd have had you playing the ghost. I'd have had you playing Alex in your head, in your mind. And I promise you, the next time you played Alex, you would have been mentally, you would have done, you would have done beat him so many sets already in your head. So now when you played him in a tournament, you, you feel me? Like you, you, you would be mentally prepared to win that match. And if you lost, you would actually be really upset because you would just got through beating him four times back at your house. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so I, I, I hope this helps people. And I, I actually, you guys kind of did, did give me to get give out one of my biggest nuggets when it comes to one of the secrets of, of my success and what I don't like to tell anybody other than people that I really feel like can use it. That's really the, one of the biggest secrets that got me to being the, the player I became. Uh, it's just believing or just going, it's just practice, just repetition. Like I said, I promise you, anybody watching this, as probably knows who Tiger Woods is, knows who Tom Brady are. You know, Tom Brady is a great example. I mean, that guy did not throw the best football, right? He wasn't Dan Marino. He wasn't, I mean, there's a lot of guys that threw a lot better football, but that guy mentally up here believed every time he stepped on the football field, just like Kobe, right? He believed he was going to win. And that's just the difference. I mean, that's just, um, that's the difference. Uh, Chris, not to change subjects, but uh, I will tell you this. When it comes to all my years of playing professional pool, uh, and even now and to this day, the best player that I've ever played against, the best mental player, the best person that I think is the toughest to beat, when I was young, when I was as I, after I retired, and even today, which is crazy because it's, that's, it's, it's, that's, the fact that I played him when I was in my peak and he still plays today, it's crazy to say this versus the Earls, the Johnnies, and the Efren. So all the people that are watching this that might know who I am and remember me from the 90s and knew that that's the era I grew up in, the Buddy Halls, uh, the Johnny Archers, the Efrens, the Bustamantes, the Earl Stricklands, those were like the big names. Those guys can't beat Alex. Alex has something, in my opinion, that is just different than even than Shane. I mean, I, I think Alex just has this warrior mentality, this mental. He he has it here. He has the Tom Brady. He has the it, right? He's the only, and, and so, like I said, not to switch subjects about what we were talking about earlier, guys, but to talk about maybe about some of the players now and the players I played with, I mean, Johnny, obviously, he was, he was my mentor. I love Johnny. I mean, Efren does things that nobody else can do. But if you go watch, if you watch, right now watch videos of those guys play, I promise you, if you watch a match of, 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 of Efren, of Earl, like back in the 90s, back in the 2000s, when they were playing their, like, top-notch game, they miss balls, like, every third or fourth game. They, they miss, like, makeable shots. They just miss balls. When Alex is playing his game, he doesn't miss nothing. Kind of like, so like before we got on air, Chris, you know, I was talking about filler, you know, and, and uh, the other kid, I keep on forgetting his name. Uh, you know, yeah, it, uh, Federer that's pretty much winning everything, right? These kids now, when I started watching some YouTube videos of those, of those, those guys, I, I'll call them kids because they are kids. You know, like three or four or five years ago, me and my dad were sitting there watching. My dad loves pool, way probably more than I do. Like they don't miss a shot. Like, I mean, I, I, I would watch matches of them race to eleven playing whoever, or like when Phillips started doing the uh, Roy's basement, right? Man, that kid played. He would go four hours and not miss a ball. Like four hours and not miss a ball. Like, it, like, I mean, it's just stupid how good, you know, that this young generation, this new core guys, 
you know, so I think it's like kind of a no brainer, I guess, you know, what's the old saying? Like the new generation is always better than the old generation, but I guess in certain sports, I think it is debatable. I don't think it's debatable in pool, in my opinion, uh, as far as what I see, you know, like I said, and I've seen and played with the best and, and, and I, and, you know, I haven't been around at the events enough to know if it is here, Sean, but I'm assuming it's 100% here. They have studied what I basically talked about for the last 30 minutes. They studied the Tom Brady's. They studied the Kobe Bryant's. They studied the Michael Jordan's. And they took what they learned from them and put it in the pool. And now you're seeing the evidence. They just don't make – like they just go hours – on TV, which is not easy to do. And they just like never make a mistake, right? It just never like, I mean, they might miss one here or there, but I promise you, if you go back and watch like a, like a 98 or 90, whatever, even 80s or 90, whatever, whatever video you can find, because YouTube's obviously popping them up now, of a good like Earl and, you know, Ephraim video on, by the way, easier equipment, right? Like the, the pockets are bigger. Uh, they missed. I mean, are, are they some of the best players to ever play the game? Absolutely. But these kids now, this this generation, if if this generation played the best Earl Strickland, the best Johnny Archer, like not not Earl now, not Johnny now, the best Earl, the best Johnny, the best Efren, that those guys couldn't beat these kids. Now Alex, I know it's crazy to say, Alex was at the end of that era that I was in, and he's now making like a little resurgence. I, you know, and I know we haven't even talked about Shane, but, you know, Alex, to me, is just, uh, he has that mental capacity. So I'll, I'll go ahead real quick and tell you why I have him number one in, in my book and it'll always be my, number one in my book. I played Johnny. I played Earl. I, I never really gambled against a lot of those guys, but I did gamble against Alex three, three times. The one thing about pool, guys, and, you know, whoever is watching this, you guys, I'm pretty sure you played. When you gamble, especially when you play somebody in a headset or you play till somebody, till the, the cash is gone, or most time when you're playing just a tournament, a race to 11, usually the deciding factor in who wins or who loses, somebody puts a little more heat or runs out just a little more than the other person, right? And then the other person kind of, you know, wilters or, or makes a mistake or two because they feel like ah, if I if I miss you know I, I, that 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 person's gonna run out you know kind of like Sean I was telling you about the mental aspect they're playing that person versus playing the table so they get in that mindset to where they feel like if they make a mistake because of the heat that 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 other person's applying by not ever making a mistake if they miss they're gonna lose and that's what usually causes somebody to eventually like if you, if you watch a good a headset. You know, where somebody wins one, for those that are watching don't know what a headset is, you win one, you lose one, you're even. You win two, you're two ahead. The other person wins two, now you're back to even. So you have to get 10 or 15 ahead of the other person. I think nowadays, last 5, 10, 15 years, it seems like they play like races to 50 or race to 100, and the score might be, you know, 100 to 92. Well, I mean, hey – Congrats to the guy that hit 100, but he's actually only eight ahead. Now, obviously, during there might have been times where he might have got more ahead, or the other guy actually might have been more ahead at some point. So I'm not saying that that's what they're doing now, like playing the long races is not an accurate way to find out. But the true way to find out who the better player is is to play like a long, like a 10 or 15 ahead. If you get 10 or 15 ahead of somebody, trust me, I tell you, like you, you know, you've, uh, you know, you've done that. So. The point about Alex, guys, is I play Alex three different times. And the last time, he won the first, I won the second. The third time we played in Reno, we put up money. Johnny and Tony went with me. Ronnie Wiseman was 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 in with Alex. We played, uh, we played 10 ahead for 5,000. And we played pretty much after the matches were over. We were playing in, in the, uh, at the Sands Regency in Reno, Nevada. And we were playing – in this like there was like a practice room kind of like they have at most tournaments but anyway they had a practice room so we played and i'm telling you guys i was playing the reason why i decided to play them because i literally like just got through playing like some of the best pool so i knew i was playing like probably 
at that moment, probably my peak, like nobody knew it. I was playing probably the best for my life. That's why I approached Alex and said, Hey, you want to play? Like I actually kind of like went to him and, you know, and, and got the match here. So with that being said, when I tell you that I played some of the best pool for two straight days of me running four racks, five racks, miss, right? And then he'd run four racks, and then he'd miss. I come back, I run four or five racks. Like we were literally playing, like I, I couldn't, I, I would say YouTube did a video that obviously they would nowadays, but they didn't. But I remember that set, we played some hellacious pool. Like we both were like, it was just amazing. And so the reason why he's always gonna have my respect probably a little bit because of this one turn or just one actual, you know, time that we played, he got my best game. Like he literally, I mean, I, I, I mean, I kept coming. I kept coming. He, 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 there was nothing, it wasn't nothing he was doing. You know, I was just so mentally ready that I was, I kept applying the pressure and he didn't go nowhere. Like he, it didn't phase him. He, every time I would finally miss, it was like he would hop up on the table and run four more racks. I'm like, man, like, was, like, what do I have to do to make this kid, like, wilter a little bit? Like, make, you know, make him nervous. We actually miss, like, miss his balls. Usually, if you keep applying the pressure, they eventually wilter. Like, last night's championship game, you know, Michigan, you know, that front, they keep on applying the pressure. In football, that defense applies that pressure. That offense eventually, you know, that, that, that the quarterback can't do a whole lot. That's where I felt, and I kept on applying the pressure, and Alex didn't go nowhere. He didn't phase. He didn't budge. His his mentality, I saw it in his eyes. Like, I could see it. So, so as crazy as it sounds, we played for two days, like six, seven, eight hours each night, and we're dead even at, 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 towards the second. I forgot how long we've been playing the second night. I woke up to him, and I go, I don't know about you, buddy, but I can find something else better to do than this. <laughs> and he goes, I said, so I don't know if you, if it's cool with you, but I'm okay if you. I I, I would like to quit. I'm not. I, I won't quit if you want to continue, but I I'm cool to quit. He goes, I'm done. I'm good too. And, and we literally we shook hands. We we pounded it out. We took the money down. We broke dead even. And guess what? Multiple times after that, he even might even offer me a spot. And people are like, you're not gonna play. I'm like, listen. I'm not getting in the ring with that dog again. You know, like <laughs> you have to understand, you know, like it, at that point, it didn't matter if he gave me two games on the wire. It didn't matter. Like his men, his mental fortitude, like I knew what he was. And I, and I, and even after that, I didn't see it nowhere else. So I want to tell you what I did guys. I, you know, for those people that were around back when I was, when I was around, even when I wasn't playing, I started betting every time he played. I got, or if he got in a gambling match, I would literally, I don't care if he was giving up, you know, playing one pocket, he would give people like nine to five or he would spot these crazy spots. Whatever he, whenever he got in the ring, right, I was looking, anybody want to bet against Alex? Like, because I, because I knew that mentally there was nobody that was going out, you know, he was, he wasn't going to fold. Like if, if he lost and he obviously he lost occasionally, but if he lost, it wasn't because he folded, you know. Uh, and to this day, I still think I, I can't really tell off the top of my head because I did spend a lot of years away from the game. I don't know how many times he maybe gambled a really high set and lost. But if he did, I, 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 I'd be shocked if I watched the video where he dogged it or he, you know, you know, didn't come through. I, I would more or less say the other person just – uh, outplayed him, you know what I mean? And versus him, you know, folding, which is what most players, even the best players like Johnny or Roy Efron. I mean, I've watched Efron dog a lot of balls, you know, like when, when the heat is on. So anyway, that's kind of my story about Alex and who I think is the best player. Now, obviously I think this, there's a, uh, the, the kid we uh, d have discussed a couple of times and even Josh Filler. I, I think Alex, I'm not sure if Alex can beat him, uh, but, he's still in my mind, like will always be the best player I've ever witnessed or, or played against, or even like I say, even to this day, I still think he's the best player uh, on the planet, you know, playing all games, but obviously this, this, uh, you know, this <coughs> federal kid has pretty much uh, taken everybody by storm is beating everybody. So.
so let's pause right wow. here and we'll do a second part. Um, let's take a, we've been in exactly an hour. Um, and then uh, we'll do it. We'll take a bathroom break. We'll come back in. We'll do a second part. Cool. Okay. Right. We're going to take a quick break. Yep. We'll be right back. All right. Hey guys, we're back with another episode of the Pulling Around Show. Um, we ended the last episode um, with uh, Mike Coltrane, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna do part two now. Um, Mike, thanks for joining us again. Um, so we talked about we left off the last time where you were talking about uh, playing Alex Pagline, um, and you know played a couple of sets, and then y'all you know, was just going back and forth and bumping heads and until that third set y'all just had enough and decided we'll just we'll just call it quits and and leave friends so um so talk about your uh your, your times that you were at the billiard palace in tulsa and like playing uh playing james walden yeah so my biggest set i ever played was there in, in oklahoma where, where you live uh i was playing really good pool and had spent enough time there to where I got to know James. You know, I played in a couple of tournaments with him. I knew he was like, you know, the hometown hero. I respected the delivering, you know, dog life out of his game. I was just, I would be at the palace. I would go back to North Carolina or I would go wherever and I would, I would come back. And I, and I, and I learned real quick. I, you know, I was, I consider myself pretty smart. So I was pretty aware of what was going on. I thought James was, one of the better unknown players in the country at the time. But James had a reputation where he just didn't want to leave. He didn't want to become a professional pool player. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember if he did anything outside playing pool at the time during those two or three years I was spending time in Tulsa. But because he did, you know, obviously, you know, make a little bit, you know, did pretty good just, you know, beating up on all the little tournaments they had. But I will say that, uh, I watched enough to realize, to, to feel like at least that my game for like, you know, during that period of time started elevating, elevating, elevating. So there was like moments when I would leave and come back, leave and come back. I feel like my game had gotten better. And obviously, you know, James is, was older than me. I was in my uh, uh, early 20s. So I was like drastically, like constantly, like getting a little bit better. And James was probably like in his 30s. So I felt like, you know, he, you know, he was still the same level. So anyway, that led me to where I ran into a backer who had fell in love with my game and said, Hey, Michael, uh, if you run into anybody that wants to bet really high and you like your game, give me a phone call. So fast forward to James, I felt like it was going to be a, a, a dog fight playing even, but if he gave me any spot, I feel like I had the advantage. I felt like, you know, he couldn't give me the eight ball. I feel like he couldn't give me, you know, a game or two on the wire or if we played races. I felt like, you know, if we played even, he was a little bit better, but he could not, if he spotted me anything, that would give me the advantage. On top of, I just felt like I was, I feel like I could beat him even. I just, I knew, you know, if he gave me a spot, I had the best of it. And, you know, when you're playing pool back then, you're always looking to get the edge, right? So, I ended up approaching him and ended up asking, you know, we kind of, you know, went back and forth. He didn't want to give me nothing. And he said, he basically then ended up telling me if I bet enough, which I don't blame him for at the time, you know, thinking like, hey, he's never seen me play a big set other than maybe 500 or 1,000. Uh, if that, uh, hey, if you bet five or 10, I'll give you the eight. You know, and, I, and so my my mentality was, Ah, okay, so he just needs to be bets enough, like, you know, I'll fold. So he's going to give me a spot now. So I'm, anyway, I'm, I make the phone call. My buddy flies in and takes literally every bet, writes it all down. I think we ended up having like 31, 32,000 bet. Uh, and we played, uh, it was 10 ahead, played 10 ahead. They, 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 roped, they roped it all for us uh, at, at, their, at, at the palace. You know, and, and what I loved about those days, man, you had a 24 hour pool room. You had, you know, you, you can call it good or bad, but you had what I call pretty decent food for a pool room versus like, I mean, just as good as going to McDonald's or Burger King, right? You know, you, and, and, and they served the food 
24 hours. So you could even you could have, you get eggs and bacon at six, 6 a.m. So there was nothing like those days when you had pool a pool room that was open 24 hours. That was you know I was in my early 20s. You had you know teenage girls, not teen. I'm sorry, not teenage girls. You had 18, 19 year old girls, <laughs> old, old, old enough girls running around. Uh, 20 girls my age uh, of age running around that was it was it was a fun place to be during that time there was a couple of girls there that you know that worked at Hooters and they love pool and you know so when I came to town and you know I, I beat up on pretty much everybody there right you know I, I was able to to uh, you know get a couple of dates but back to James Walton first so yeah so we, we play at 10 ahead and uh we played for two days I mean it took uh we played. We agreed to play eight hours a day, and I think around. I think I actually I started out pretty well. I think I got up as much as six, seven. I might even got to eight at one point. Uh, and then he got obviously got back to even, and then I know he got up six, seven at one point, and I got back to even, and then we took more bets, and then. I remember from that point on, he pretty much took control. And, I, you know, looking back on that set, the difference was, literally the difference was, and it's not no knock on James, because I, I, I respect the crap out of his game. He was definitely the more seasoned player, meaning like he was that guy that I became a few years later on tour that, I literally was so consistent. Like I told you in 99 in the first episode, I was voted 99, the most consistent player on tour. Because if you played me a match, I wasn't going to make many mistakes. Like you had to beat me. And James did that playing that set. I was young. I was, I was ready, but I was, you know, he outbroke the crap out of me. Meaning it wasn't that he made balls. He just like always kept the cue ball on the table. Me, Every three or four times I broke, cue ball fly off table or scratch or, you know, it would – whatever. I, I didn't have great cue ball control when I broke the when I broke the balls back then. I had a really big break, and at times I could – I'd run three or four racks, but I was so inconsistent, and James was very – James was the more consistent player. He was the more, you know, just stayed steady and didn't kind of go nowhere, and I didn't put enough heat on him over enough long periods of time because of those constant mistakes that I made at that time in my career that the eight ball really never came into play. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm not saying he could have given me the seven, but, uh, you know, the eight ball didn't really make a big deal. Uh, so I would honestly say if I were the one, I probably would have beat him even. You know, like I don't remember a lot of games where – you know, I made eight on the break or I made a bunch of combinations on the eight, maybe a game here or there. I mean, obviously we played for almost two days. I mean, and, and, and look, James got, James got, he took my best punch at that time. It was not the same punch I gave Alex. James, no disrespect. I don't think James could have withstood that punch because that punch, that was the, that was what he was doing to me to a degree. I mean, like literally he just, he was just more consistent. I don't, I would I would definitely say that my best game would beat James uh, when I got to that level, especially up here, mental, my mentality wise. But at that time we played that set, uh, I wasn't ready. Now, like I said, the money didn't bother me, the pressure didn't bother me. He just was the better seasoned player at that time. But I loved that. I loved I loved Tulsa. I loved every moment there. I enjoyed it. There was a lot of gambling. It was just a great place to be. And, you know, and growing up in North Carolina, there was a lot of trees, a lot of hills. There's nothing like, you know, going to a town where every road is is, is a square and everything's flat. You know what I mean? And I remember driving through, you know, from Oklahoma to, to, to St. Louis and the Kansas City, Missouri a lot with Gabe Owen, my old running partner. And, you know, as a kid from North Carolina, as crazy as it sounds, I was like, Where's the tornado? Where's the tornado? Right? You see the you see the dark dark clouds. I'm like I, I, like I've always been a kid that wanted to see one. I just wanted it to be way over there, right? So yeah, I mean like that's I, I've always loved the Midwest for that for the flat the flatness of it. And yeah, you know you know I, there's a bad storm here right now in North Carolina, 
And, you know, we were talking before we got on, Chris, about, you know, <laughs> the storms in Oklahoma, obviously, and the Midwest. But, yeah, uh, the Midwest is, is – it, it always holds a special place in my heart. I spent a lot of time in Tulsa and Dallas also, uh, you know, doing a lot of gambling. And my pool game came a long ways in those towns in the Midwest. So the Midwest will always have a special place in my heart. Um, going back a little bit on these sets, especially one with James and even one with Alex, are you racking your own balls or are you racking for each other? No. So back then we would rack for each other. I want to say the a headset with James, we did rack our own because there was like a technical, like back then, like people were screwing you on the rack or whatever. But actually, I'm pretty, you know what, Sean? I'm pretty sure we racked. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we right. In other words, I right when James won, he right when I when I won. And you know, and uh, you know, I learned just from people showing me kind of what to look for. So I would, you know, when James would rack or whenever people rack. And I'm not, I don't know if I knew what to look for then, uh, but I learned what to look for. So to a, to a degree, it didn't matter who rack. You know, I would make them re rack. But yeah, to answer your question, I'm now I think about it, I'm 95 percent sure. Uh, that we were racking on balls. I mean, no, in other words, like I would rack, James would break, James would rack, I would break. So I, I, I miss that. I, I miss watching the headsets, and I, I like it when uh, the opponent racks. You know, you get to dissect their break, so to speak. And I, I, I like that style of pool. I wish it would come back. Well, it's like, and, you know, Turning Stone was racked for, rack for each other, and it's winner, winner break. So, yeah. That, uh... Yeah, you know, you know, they they've changed a lot of things, you know, and it's it's funny. Uh, so I will give you guys one good story here because this was a a a uh, a very documented, I think, still to this day. Uh, and I and, and I will honestly say I was somewhat a part of knowing what was going on and having a little bit of say. And looking back on it, I wish obviously I wouldn't have felt the way I felt. So there. Were, and the one I'm referring to is overall pool has made their changes. And I think like you guys say, I think at the end of the day, kind of some things, man, you just got to leave it alone. Like there's nothing wrong with changing certain things, but pool is just a game that, you know, when, when it's your turn to break, it's your turn to break. The opponent racks the balls. You know what I mean? You have the right to inspect the rack. So if you want to make the guy re-rack, you can make him re-rack. I mean, at the end of the day, that's where, and if you don't know what to look for, because he knows how to rat the balls or he knows how to position to where they're not going to split out properly. He's going to so, somewhat, as they call, slug you. And that was that was the advantage that, you know, Johnny and Tony Watson and, and you know, and, and a lot of guys. And, I, yeah, I said Johnny because he's my mentor, but he was one of the best at it, at, you know, at, at giving you a slug. That was, that was just an advantage. It, it wasn't cheating. It wasn't. It was kind of like stealing signals from, you know, the opposing team, right? You're not sitting in the stands like Michigan, maybe filming somebody, but you, you, there was something you knew that gave you a slight advantage. You knew how to write the balls. You knew how to make the balls split apart in a certain manner where they wouldn't uh, go a certain way. So anyway, to your point, I agree with you. Uh, my story I want to tell you guys was referring to the Corey Duell uh, uh, situation right at the end of my career when Corey kind of came on the scene and started the soft break. I was very much against it. I was against it. We all were against it. Like, and, and, and we were, I think, more against it for because of the results he was getting, right? So it's more of like, I, I, I wasn't, I personally wasn't jealous. It was more of like, wow, you know, okay, you know, how is he doing this? And, and, and then, you know, he turns around and wins the U.S. Open. And I tell the story for those who don't know, Corey Duell, uh, won the U.S. Open and was one of the – it was basically like my, uh, you know, toughest opponent. He was like the – like me and him were fighting to be the next Johnny Archer basically, right? And and I had already kind of had a leg up and he comes out of nowhere and he creates this break that allows him to start like just in about eight to 12-month span. He starts snap, snapping off tournaments left and right. And the break, for those that don't know or – don't you know? I never heard the story before. He would break from a certain angle, and he would hit him so soft, like a cut break, 
as people probably have seen a cut break, he would cut them and, and the cue ball would literally go to the rail right below uh, the side and just slowly bounce back out. And the balls would, he would hit them so soft that the one ball would either go in the, in the, in either side or maybe just a little pass the side and all the other balls would stay at the bottom end of the table. And he was, what he was doing was he was able to either, either make the one in either side or the corner ball every time, every time. He was making one, one, one of those balls or both and keeping all the balls down at the end of the table. And he got really good at, at navigating. He was, you know, I mean, during his, you know, peak, you know, he was really good at one pocket. So having those balls stay down there, even if they were one or two of them got cluttered up, having them all right there versus spread out throughout the whole course of the table. And like I said, he literally like 95% of the time made a ball on the break. So, uh, you know, using that break. So the, the more of the story is, is that he created something that none of us had created. Kind of like the Philadelphia Eagles have created this tush push right on third and fourth and one for you guys that I'm hoping everybody here watching has watched football and knows what the tush push is, where them guys, you know, on third and fourth and one can get the first down. And everybody else has tried to do it and nobody can do it like they can do it. And now the NFL is talking about whether they're going to, you know, ban it or not, right? And this is what happened with Coy. So he did it for a period of time. Well, what do you think we, we we started doing? We started trying to copy what he was doing. And nobody could do it like Coy. Coy actually offered me the eight. And and this was right when like he had started doing it. And we all kind of knew what he was doing, but we didn't know what he was doing. And I went to Johnny and Tony Allen back then. Tony Allen, the rest of the guy, rest of the one of my best friends. Uh, that, 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 that was my core group of guys I grew up with. By the way, I should have told that in the first episode, but Johnny and Tony were my mentors. I, I, that, I made that my click. And those are the guys I learned everything from. I was able to position, position myself with the lottery, Johnny living in Raleigh. And then Tony just being Johnny's best friend already. Those were the three, the two guys that I hung out with at every tournament. Anyway, uh, those guys, like I went, I would go to those guys for anything I was doing. If I was matching up or gambling, like Johnny and Tony, they would usually go in with me or at least give me their opinion if I was getting staked. And I usually didn't get staked. That, 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 uh, the, the session with James was rare because it was so big. I usually bet my own money or had somebody go in with me. You know, like Gabe used to go in with me or Johnny or, or, or Tony. We, you know, we would play a $2,000 set. I put up a 1000 They put up a 1000 So I, I was – I was when I, when I did gamble, I put up my own money. I wasn't big on getting staked. Same thing with tournaments, guys. When I played tournaments – I would put it, I would, I used to tell people, why are you letting this guy put you in an $80 tournament just because he's paying your hotel bill? I borrow the money, man. Like, you know, you're like, you're your favorite, you know, to cash. So borrow the money and, and this way you keep everything. Anyway, back to my story. I got off base here. Sorry about that. Back to my story about Corey and the break. So he created that break and we all tried to figure out how to do it. He offered me the eight. I accepted. We played, we were at the U.S. Open, played set for 3000 and I actually outran, I'll be honest with you, looking back on it. So I ended up winning the set, okay? And and believe it or not, I've never quit anybody winner. I don't know why we didn't play again, but we didn't play again. And I remember I, I basically I, I basically I outran the nuts. Like he had he basically trapped me with it with that break, but it wasn't it didn't work as well on that table or something. I, I forgot why, but I remember like when the set was over thinking, okay, well, I would love to play him like, you know, a heads up or dare him to give me the eight, you know, just let's play. But this whole rack thing that he was doing and he was manipulating the rack with, with his little cut break, like I, I saw it for my own self. Like I was – I could not run that. You know, the break was – I mean, it's like the serve in tennis. It's just so strong. So he won multiple tournaments, guys. And so for those watching or those viewers that don't know the story, we end up Johnny Archer and and – some other guys, and then obviously I put my vote in. I wasn't – I'm not going to say I was like a big reason why. I, I definitely was not. Uh, but looking back on it, I wish I did not – I wish I didn't vote this way. Uh, but we pretty much like 90% of the tour just didn't want him to continue to do this, and they basically got it banned. So they basically 
had it where either a the nine ball was right on the spot, or then they started making it where you had to get at least two balls back past the side. They quit. They created a couple rules, and this is kind of like as I was retiring from pool. They created a couple rules where he basically couldn't do it no more. And looking back on it, as we were talking about, you know, wishing things were like they were back in the day, looking back on it, like all he did was create something that nobody else could do. And, 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 and there was no reason why that should have ever got banned. There was no, like, I mean, he should have kept on being able to win tournaments until we, we had to, we figured out how to do it like he did or, or not like it was it was it's something that i heard I, he went to a scientist he paid money he he you know behind the scenes like we was talking in the first episode about me visualizing like tom brady and, and tiger woods when you're shooting that shot it's all about up here i mean he he figured something out he you know he 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 created an advantage for himself and we penalized him for that after he won a few events, right? And looking back on it, I wish that didn't happen. So, uh, I mean, obviously, it seems like everything that tends to happen in pool, even nowadays, I know there was, there was a magic rack. I mean, I've, you know, I, I've been in a, in a pool, Chris, you asked me earlier, you know, I, I, I'm a little more in it now. I've been a little more in tune with what's going on a lot because of, of social media and YouTube versus, you know, I was married for eight or nine years and I just wasn't around pool at all. Uh, but it seems like whenever, whenever anybody creates something that gives them an advantage or they start winning with it, it seems like the pool world seems to get rid of it. I mean, you guys can maybe, uh, you know, you know, echo it or give me some, you know, stories or you might can, you know, agree with me or just, I, I, I'm not, I think I'm pretty accurate there by saying that. See, it seems like, it seems like that's what it feels like anyway. Mm. When anybody's kind of created a break or, or done something that nobody's doing before you know it, they've, they've outlawed it somehow. Yeah. So he, he wasn't cheating. He was just creating Correct. himself an advantage over other pros to give him the best chance to win. Yes. I, I never, I never saw anything wrong with it. Oh, okay. Oh, so, oh yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. But, but you, you remember when he did that break, right? I do. I yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he, I mean, he did. I mean, it was it was a legal break. I mean, he hit the balls. He just hit them <laughs> super, super soft, and he he figured out a way to make. He was making a ball every single time, and 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 it didn't matter who wrapped the balls. I could wrap the balls. He could wrap the balls. You could wrap the balls. It didn't matter who wrapped the balls. He could. He would know where to break from, and he would know how to make a ball, and he would run out. I mean, he was he was ready. He was. He was he was an unbeatable force because of that break, but there was no reason to, you know, I mean, looking back on, it, like I said, we, we obviously just didn't like it because it, it be quickly became like, it was an unfair advantage. Right. And we outlawed it or it, it got outlawed. I'm not going to say we, as in I was really a part of it, but I remember being asked and I'm like, yeah, I don't, yeah, he shouldn't be able to do that. And I remember it, it didn't take, but a few years later after I kind of got away from pool and, I'm like, man, why did I, why did I vote? Like, why, why was I, I, I guess maybe my peers or I, I mean, I didn't like it either, but, but anyway, my whole point is like, it was not something that should have been voted. It shouldn't have been outlawed. I mean, they outlaw things nowadays when somebody creates, figure, figures out something, they just outlaw it. Yes. Yeah, that'd, like, like, ah. that'd be like telling Michael Jordan, you can't dunk on Spud West. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it makes no sense. So, so just to piggyback on like what you're saying about the whole wishing things were the way they were back in the day. I mean, you know, that was just something that he did. That it's, I mean, it literally lasted maybe a year, like a year and a half, and then they just, they just, they're like, nope, you're not doing this no more. <laughs> because he was, because he literally was winning like almost every event. Like I think I watched him like, play uh, the U.S. U.S. Open Bar Table Championship, and I think he was playing Shane McMahon. And he was he was doing that soft break that it, it wasn't outlawed, but he was doing that soft break to get Shane and and just just blistered Shane's tail. Barbecue, yeah, 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 barbecue. Yeah, I mean the, the break is huge. I mean that's that's the breaking pool is is everything. Right? Did you like, play uh, much eight ball, Michael? Was that your first game or that was that was my best game? It's funny you okay. asked that question. Great question, Sean. By the way, that was my best game. So I, I you know. Playing the junior nationals, that was what we played the first year. 
was eight ball when I was 14. Played nine ball when I was eight when I, when I went the second time. But then on the Camel Series, I realized how good I was eight ball. I didn't really realize how good I was eight ball until the Camel Series. So the Camel Series we had for four years, 96, 97, 98, 99. And we had one stop every year in Vegas. We had the World Eight Ball Championship. I don't remember how I did 96, but I can tell you how I did in 97, 98, and 99. And then when Camel didn't renew in 2000, I used to always tell the story what would have happened in 2000. So this is a true story. So in 97, I finished fourth. In 98, I finished third. In 99, I finished second to Earl. And I, I'll never forget when I lost that match to Earl. Uh, that was like my second or third, second or third. Reed beat me at JLB's. Earl beat me, maybe my, th I can't think of, my third professional finals. I never actually won a professional sanctioned event. Now, guys, I won, uh, I mean, I probably won over 50 or 60, two to 3,000 hour payout first place tournaments across, like, like, like the Viking Tour, the McDermott Tour, those type stops. I probably won 50 or 60 of those beating professionals in the finals but i but as far as like a sanctioned camel series or or u.s open or a world championship unfortunately I don't, I don't have any of those titles under my belt but i did get to the finals in a couple of those and the it was called the world eight ball championship so what was ironic sean about you asking that question was i think my it was might have been even the first year i played i remember playing uh alan hopkins who was a great, great one pocket player, eight ball player. And when I beat Allen, I remember thinking, we the match we played, it was at the Riviera uh, before they blew it, knocked it down. And they, I remember when I beat Allen, it was like we didn't play like a normal game of eight ball. It was like so much uh, strategy involved. And 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 I kind of was watching, like I kind of was watching. I was piggybacking off what he was doing because I knew he was really good at that game. There was another guy named Jeff Carter from uh, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois, that played the game really good. Uh, that I also beat one or, one or two times during the three years they played. But I'm gonna tell you guys what I realized about eight ball with a lot of other touring professionals of the '96 players that Camel had all three years. I was amazed at how many players that played as good as I did, or even a couple, I'm not going to name a name, name, name names, a couple of players that played better than I did, nine ball, that is, that when they played eight ball, they made the biggest mistake. And this is secret number two from my pool course that I have not yet released. Okay. For all you hammers out there that play eight ball, the number one biggest mistake that everybody makes playing eight ball. And I, and I realized this, early on. Uh, and when I realized this, I kind of kept it to myself, kind of like Corey did with his break, is when it's your turn to shoot and your balls and you got lows or highs, stripes, sides, whatever you want to call them, if your balls, if you have any two balls that are tied up and you are not 100% sure, you can break those balls out. And usually when I say break them out, break them out within the first shot or two. I don't mean you see a way to run three or four year balls and then break them out towards the end. If you can't break them out within the first shot or two to get what I call your trouble you know, out of the way, then you need to immediately not even pocket one ball unless maybe you have to pocket one ball. The point of the story is the secret to playing eight ball to be, and why I was astonished at other pros that did not do this. They let those two balls tied. The, I would call the trouble, right? When you when you walk up to the table and you see you got highs and you got two two high balls tied up against a rail, they would run all the other balls off, and then they got they would try at the very end to try to go two rails and bump into those balls, right? And if they missed, now they try to play safe, and guess what? Now I got all my balls wide open. One 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 of uh, I'm gonna give this the best analogy to those listeners who are going to listen to this best analogy is uh, don't get beat up in a pool room by, by offering this. But if you go in, if you can play good enough, Sean, based on what you told me earlier, you probably play good enough. If you walk in a pool room tonight, tomorrow, this weekend, 
and say, I'll play your game eight ball, sir, but here's how we're going to play. I'm going to break. You select what balls you want, highs or lows. We'll take all your balls off. All you have to do is make the eight ball, but I get first shot. I I used to beat people out of beers and out of twenty dollars and not any not any real money because I didn't want to get beat up. But that it was kind of a gaff to that. It's kind of a it's kind of a, it's a proposition, it's an offer that sounds really good. Oh, all I gotta do is make the eight ball. Oh, okay, yeah. You I, you're taking all my balls off? Absolutely. But guys, there's such a big if you if you can play it at all, especially on the bar table, if you can if you're if you're a decent player, right? For like a shortstop or better. Guys, you that person who lets you take all the balls off, and all you gotta do is make the eight ball. They're at such a big, big disadvantage because of all your balls being open. So either a you're gonna run out. If you get a little out of line, you can probably play safe to where they can't see the eight. It's just such a big advantage. So when I was playing those years, and I finished fourth, third, second, I literally won a lot of matches because the players I was playing against that played my level nine ball or or better. Every time they the, the balls are broken out and they had trouble, they never tried to get the trouble out. They would always try – they'd run all their balls off and then try to get – and sometimes they would do it, right? But more times than not, they wouldn't. They wouldn't get rid of their trouble. And when I say get rid of the trouble to all you amateurs listening, watching, I'm talking about if you just bump the two balls to break them out and, and give your opponent a shot, so be it. Bump – get rid of your trouble. Make your balls all available to be pocketed somewhere. Once you have that, once your balls are free, then you just wait for your shot. But that's the biggest mistake people make playing eight ball. And I see it. <laughs> I mean, it, it's probably happening right now as we're speaking, right? Somewhere, you know, playing the APA. I mean, that's just that's just the biggest mistake that amateurs make, pros make, players make playing eight ball. And it, and it's a major, major, major mistake when you're playing the game of eight ball. If you have trouble, I don't mean address it like down the road. I mean address it immediately. Go ahead and break. As soon as you get to the table, break. get them balls. If you can't break them out by shooting one of your balls and breaking them out, just break them out. Break them out and try to play safe the best you can. And I promise you, you'll have a lot better success playing the game of eight ball than if you leave those trouble balls even if you think you can make three balls and then cut this ball and go over and break them out. No, don't make if you once you made those three balls and then you try to use that fourth ball to break them out, you've you've those three balls you made has made it easier for your opponent. So if you can't use it, I would say in the first two shots, if it were so it's your shot at the table, you got two balls tied up. If you can't use the if you if you can't see a ball somewhere to pocket, which you should be able to, if there's enough balls on the table, you should be able to find some ball somewhere to go into those balls that are tied up that you can try to pocket and also break your trouble out. If you can't do it on the first shot, but you say, okay, well, I can make this ball and then now shoot this ball and break them out, that's fine. That would be kind of like my, my rule of thumb would be by ball number two. So if it's my shot at the table, if I couldn't do it by ball number two, I would just go ahead and break the balls out and try to play safe and move on. So okay, now are we talking about head-on break playing eight ball or second ball break? Meaning, uh, you, when you break an eight ball, are you running the cue ball into the the lead ball or the second ball? Yeah, hey, no, it, um, it, uh, it doesn't matter if you break the balls head-on. I'm saying like when it's your shot, if you have two balls, say two of your stripes, you know, like say you know, because I know there's different rules. So say like you know, the the balls are broke. And then there's been there's your balls are, have been established, which like the rules yeah. that we played, the rules we played were a ball had to be pocketed after the break. Once a ball was pocketed after the break, now those are your balls. So if my balls were low and it was my shot and I had two low balls, I had you know, the seven and the six and the seven that were tied up, I would immediately break those out, even if it was just touch them to just make them come unhooked, right? Come apart. I would I would just nudge them and maybe try to play safe off nudging them. But I would go ahead and take care of that immediately. Say I say I broke the balls and I, I want low balls, right? But I see trouble. I got two trouble balls, but 
but but there's there's two high balls are also trouble. And, and I just like the rest of the layout of the low balls. I would pocket a low ball to get now give myself low balls, right? And then my next shot is either A, shooting a low ball to break those balls out or just breaking those balls out and playing safe because he's got trouble too. That's another thing, guys. If, if, if you got low balls and he's got high balls and y'all both have trouble, then that's another reason to go right ahead, even if it's just bump your balls and give him a shot. Go ahead. Give him a shot. He's got trouble because watch what he's going to do. Nine times out of ten, I don't care how good they play, when they got their trouble, they're going to try to run all their balls off and then try to break the, their trouble out. And if they, and guess what? A lot of times they don't do it, and then they leave you. You just got through bumping your trouble. Now your balls are clear, and guess what happens? You run the table. I just I want a lot of games playing like that, and it didn't take long to realize. Like once I did it once or twice, I'm like, ah, okay, this is like <laughs> I got I got like a little secret here. I got I, I know something that they don't know, like. Like I would do it and think they saw me do it. So the next game that they, they would do it and then they never would. They, they would still leave their trouble always. And they would always try to take care of it at the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. They always try to take care of it. And I'm pretty sure you guys are probably guilty of it too. If you played an eight ball, I'm pretty sure you've tried to you know, get those trouble ball, those two balls tied together at the very end versus mm -hmm. taking care of it immediately. And, mm -hmm. and like I say, mm -hmm. go ahead and get rid of it. The more balls on the table, Go ahead and get rid of your. Go ahead and untie your trouble balls out and leave all the balls on the table. The the better chance you have at still winning that game. So I think he. I think he's asking. He's asking when you played eight ball, what did you prefer, head ball break or second ball break? Oh, head ball. I'm sorry, Sean. Hey, I I I've, I've always my whole career from from four years old to when I retired, I, I hit them head on. Uh, you know whether it was from the side rail whether it was breaking from the box like we did for the camel tour, I always just believed in hitting the balls head on with, with a center ball. Yeah, I never really got into the cut break or any type of specific eight ball break. You know, I mean, obviously playing one pocket, yeah, you hit them a certain way, but but playing eight ball or playing nine ball or playing ten ball head on every time. So tell us – so camel pro tour is done – but now you're you're on the, you're on the Moscone team. So back then, what was the process of of picking the players, and then what was your experience like on that on that team? So ninety nine was the last year of the Camel Tour. What they did is they took the top four Americans ranked on the Camel Series. Uh, so basically, that's and then. They had a, a, a captain who chose two, so it was six of us total. So the captain would had two choices to pick any two, and then the other four were basically by the by the top four rankings of the Camel Series. So that's how I, I earned my spot, you know, the first time, and that was also a goal of mine: finish in the top ten, finish in the top four Americans to make the Moss Twenty Cup team. So and, and I was able to accomplish that. Uh, and the Moscone Cup, my first year was 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 unreal. It was a great experience. I actually played pretty well. Uh, there was there was a shot uh, that I made. Sorry guys, I guess there's an amber alert here in my 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 state. Give it a second here, and then I'll finish the story. That's unfortunate. Huh? That, you you guys have that in your in your in your it's okay. Yes, yeah. Once once that once that starts, there's no, there's no mutant that, so it is what it is. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So, well, as far as uh, you know, what what, what were we just talking about? Stony Cup. Oh, Stony Cup. Okay, yeah. So so I actually my first or second match, I, I there was it was here. I'm not, I'm not trying to make this up, but it was actually Hill Hill. I was playing uh, partners, but it was a shoot TMS. Me and Jeremy Jones were playing, and I got snookered where I could kind of see half ball. Anyway, and anyway, I, 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 back that back then we didn't have jump cues, and I'm that's just my personal opinion. Not a fan of jump cues. We had them, we didn't have them. They're back. I, I'm I, if you can't see the ball, or you, I, I just don't believe in having an advantage with a jump. Anyway, I, I took a full cue, I jumped, uh, 
pocketed the ball, went like two rails, got position, and ran out. The next, so and so we, we won the match. The next day, when I when I came in, they they had me like try to recreate. I, I guess it was like a big deal. I guess you know, oh, when you when when you're in London, which is I don't know how it is now or how it has been recently, but I tell you guys from playing the Moscone Cup when I played the two years they were both in London. When you're over there in London and and matchroom sports, which I think puts on now, what I realized real quickly is you could go right down the street to the pub and they're packed watching it on TV. And it's in like, you know, 18 or 20 different countries live on matchroom sports all over the UK, all over the whole, you know, basically that side of the globe. But back in the US, we didn't get a chance to watch it until like a month later if that on ESPN or whatever broadcast that would show it. So my point of telling that story is the next day I come in, I guess that shot, I guess, I guess 99, you know, I guess, I don't know if the internet, no, I don't know if the internet was around. Anyway, it, it was, there was enough buzz around that shot that, that the production team came up to me and said, Hey, we, you know, that, like there was a lot of talk about what happened that shot. And, and so we, so they, they, we tried to recreate, the shot and they tried to film me like redoing the shot and I couldn't, I couldn't do it again. I couldn't do it again. It, it was, I mean, I think I might've pocketed it one time maybe, but I didn't get positioned. So they were trying to have me make it and run out again. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. We spent, we spent like 30 minutes doing it. It was, no. that was pretty funny. But that, 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 that was, yeah, that, 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 that was, yeah, that, that was one of my best memories of the Mos- That was probably my best memory of the Moscone Cup, obviously. Who was the coach, or was there a coach when you were on? It was – so I played two years. It was uh, – I think it was Rempe the first year. And I want to say – I don't – you know what? Honestly, guys, I don't know – I was looking around. The reason why I was looking around because I think I had, I think I have a picture somewhere of me holding the trophy, but I don't know where it's at. It's in one of these boxes back here. And I was I was going to look at the trophy and tell you who the coach was. Uh, I think it was Rempe the first year, Jim Rempe, because uh, I know he didn't play on the team, uh, and I don't remember in two thousand. But I remember so so ninety nine. Uh, I got to play because of I earned it. And then I know you want to get into this, Chris, and I know our time is a certain, so I'm going to go ahead and get into it right now This because this coincides with my Sony Cup. That year, while I was playing in my Sony Cup, my arm my or my wrist, my hand, had like a slight, like like pretty much like this. I don't know if you guys can see this. Like it literally like had this. I mean, it was so slightly. I, I remember I could feel it, like right now. I, I felt it a couple of times towards the end of the uh, Camel Series, I got like in like you know in like the finals or like in a really big hill hill match like a really big pressure situation. I felt my wrist kind of quiver a little bit, and I I, you know, I just took it as like I got nerves and I got a little nervous and and but you know my stroke was still you know nice and, and fluid, but I would have that slight little quiver and it and it escalated just a little bit more than usual during the Moscone Cup. But I was okay with it because Johnny had told me for years. Coltrane, when you get to the Moscone Cup, there's no pressure like the Moscone Cup. Like, it's, it's the, like, and he was right. I mean, it's not just the TV, because I've been on TV before. Man, I'll be honest with you. When you're playing for no money, they pay you. Your, your funds are already guaranteed. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. They didn't give the winning team more than the losing team. They might do that now, but they didn't do it when I was there. I mean, your prize money is already there. You're already guaranteed money. Everything's paid for. But playing for your country, and you know, when I played 99, 2000, we had troops that came over and set like in a certain section, you know, and, and you got the Europeans, they're, they're, they're chanting and they're going crazy. It's the experience, Johnny told me about it, is like no other. So the pressure was like, it was like, it was like three or four times any pool tournament, any US Open, any TV match I'd ever been on. It was, I, I don't want to exaggerate and say three or four times. I would say at least twice. I, it felt, the pressure felt. So I had this small quiver in my hand in 99. 
because I could feel the pressure. Like it was like wow. Like uh, uh, and but I still felt like I played pretty good. I feel like I I wasn't mad at my performance in '99. So we go back, come back home. We and we we, we won the trophy '99, and then I come back home and then find out there was no tour. So we took you know Camel had uh, went away and didn't want to sponsor us no more. So you know there was no tournaments to play in. So I basically. Took, you know, I took a couple months and was just hanging out home. And then I started to try to find some tournaments to go play. And like literally out of nowhere, I started seeing my arm start to go from quivering my wrist to more like my arm itself started to shake. And 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 then I, I started noticing that when I was just hitting balls in the pool room by myself at 10 in the morning. And I literally, I remember the first couple of times it happened, I wanted to go, I'm like, hold on, what's going on? So I would like go in the pool room where nobody was in there. And I, I'm not, there's no, 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 no reason to be nervous. And I would, I was playing and I'm like, what is this shake? So uh, long story short, nobody believed me at the time. I, I, I didn't, I didn't know what it was until I got diagnosed. Uh, but I have a nervous system disorder. Uh, it's called focal task trim, tremor. It's fo or focal task dystonia is the actual medical term. Dystonia is another word for tremor. And what it is, is guys, it's, it's, it's a nervous system disorder that comes from the brain, a signal from the brain to your certain side of your body that focuses when you're doing a certain task. So at the time I played pool the most, I didn't hardly ever write back then unless I had to like check into a hotel. Uh, as I got older, I started writing more and I noticed it in my writing, uh, I started noticing it when I shaved my face I started noticing when I poured last of water. I started noticing it when I do anything on a regular basis that involved my right side. What's crazy enough is, so 2000, the end of my Sony Cup, so 2000, we didn't have a tour. And as crazy as it sounds, my shake had gotten so bad or had gotten bad enough by the time that the Sony Cup rolled around back in December of the following year that I really wasn't playing pool to, to the level I wanted to play. And Johnny Archer, I'll never get called me up. Coltrane got some good news. Uh, and he knew that I wasn't like crazy about playing at the time, like just playing in general, because I was wondering what the hell was going on with, with my arm. Got some good news, but you might not like it. But just found out they're taking the same team because we don't have an actual tour to go off with the rankings. And they, they, they want to do another Marconi Cup, so they're not going to skip a year. They're going to take the same group of guys. And I think the captain might pick – I think the captain – I think whoever the captain was that year maybe chose one or two different players. So we did have a different roster. But the four players that were – that had earned the right the previous year based on the, based on the point system went back. And when I went back, I was like, oh, God. Like, like I knew – that my arm was shaking. I knew, I think I had been diagnosed at that time. And I was told, you know, that this was going to be something that was going to be something I dealt with the rest of my life. It wasn't just something that, you know, that was uh, caused because I was nervous. Uh, but I was also told that when I got put in a nervous situation, it would actually get worse. Like it would actually like, you know, the shake would become worse. And I noticed that really, it was very evident when I went to the Moscone Cup because I hadn't really played a whole lot of competitive tournaments. Uh, and so when I played that year, 2000, there's a video on YouTube right now with me playing Steve Davis. He beats me 5 nothing. That was the last match I played. And I actually, you know, looking back at that match, I actually, I, I mean, I made a few shots. I mean, I, I didn't play like, I didn't play horrible. But, I, you know, and he, and he obviously played perfect. I mean, he played great. But I did miss, miss a few shots and 100%. I mean, I missed. I'm not going to blame it all on this shake. But obviously, there was a lot going on in my head. I didn't, you know, I was, it was new to me. So, I mean, I, the shots I missed in that match were 100% due to me just not being comfortable and the arm just causing, you know, trouble. Now, you know, I, I can go to a pool room now and – Ironically, over the years, as I've gone back in the pool room, my my actual whole arm like shakes real bad, right? It's almost like I'll go in a pool room now and people will gather around whether they know me or don't know me. I can even see like the eyeballs, people that don't know me. 
almost like, how is he doing that? Like, because I actually, I can actually still run out. I can still, I, I go in spurts and I don't even need to like warm up. I can, it literally start from like the very first shot. I play the same way. I might get a little better. Uh, if I have an alcoholic beverage or two, it seems to go away a little bit. Uh, uh, so the shake is not as bad. Uh, but obviously that was something that I realized early and I'd say two or three years after being removed from the camels or from Moscone cup and not playing pool at all. I noticed if I was, you know, and, you know, had, had a few drinks and we go to the pool room and would hit balls. I'm like, Oh wow. Like, you know, it's kind of like I'm loose. And I'll go to the doctor. I'm like, doctor, like you ain't, can't give me no medication besides what I have that like gives me the same effect like alcohol, but not give me a buzz. And, you know, and I had guys, you know, talk to me and say, Hey, why don't you just get drunk before you play? I'm like, nah, I don't want to do that. But, uh, but anyway, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the backdrop of why I had to end up retiring from pool. But to be honest with you, Chris and Sean, I'm, you know, I'm glad you guys have me on here today and I, and I, and I will, I will not end it, but I will, I definitely want to say this. My life with pool was, was awesome. Like the time I spent places I traveled, the people I met, I mean, I'm, I was, I was so blessed to do what I did, but I'll be also honest with you. When I had to retire, that was like, you know, we didn't have a tour. There was a group of kind of young, I'm not going to name no names, kind of a group of uh, younger guys coming in. It, it was, it was almost like I was, I was almost happy to leave, you know, the pool industry. I didn't like where pool was going. Uh, we, like, we, we didn't really have a future and, you know, and not to, you know, uh, feel not to say that I'm like lucky by no means, but, you know, fast forward, that was 2001 to 2000, 2000, 2002, 2000, cause I, I played for a couple more years. I, like, I, I was on medication where it kind of controlled it. 2001, 2000, I think 2002 is when I actually, at some point I, I actually quit playing altogether. Cause I just would go to a, a tournament of any significance and literally couldn't beat anybody. So I was wasting my money. And I just traveled around for a year or two, just like betting on matches or, you know, gambling, you know, just betting on people that were gambling. I had like a really good knack for knowing who was going to win. But when I retired from playing pool till now, like pool really hasn't, you know, ever had really a sponsor. And I feel like almost to, to a blessing of what happened with my arm I don't know where I'd be if I was still playing, if, if, if that would have never, if, my, if I never had this disease and I didn't get married, didn't have my daughter and, you know, didn't, you know, move, move back home and didn't end up moving down here to Wilmington, North Carolina, where I currently live. Like, I don't know where my life would be. So in all reality, it didn't take me long, guys. I, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. So uh, for those watching, I apologize, but I, I'm a Christian by nature. I believe in God. And it didn't take me long after learning what I had to just start, like I, I, I had a, a few months, six months. I, it was, it sucked, right? Like, oh, my pool career was over. But it didn't take me long to realize God has a different purpose for me. He, he, he has something else meant for me to do other than play pool. And looking back on it, I'm like, I, I've had Johnny, Johnny, Johnny to, even to this day, and Johnny's still one of my best friends. And we'll, for years, we, we would, Johnny's like, Coltrane, come on now. If you wake up tomorrow and don't have it, don't have your shake. So basically, what I want to tell the audience, it, it, it didn't take but maybe a couple of years, guys. And I was mentally very good where I was at in my new life and knew that I was meant to do something else to where if I had woke up or there was a miracle di disease or a miracle drug found that, that could cure my, my arm from shaking, I was never going to go back to playing pool professionally. Now, I might have gone back to playing part-time like and still doing what I do on you know for to make a living and play like, you know, on the side. But I was never going to go back to it like full-time. Uh, so I'm, I, my life has kind of worked out very good in, in, in a sense as far as the pool, the pool, the whole pool thing. You know, I had a great career. You know, I made a name for myself. Uh, I've done some wonderful things. I, I felt like uh, when, when I talk about myself, which, you know, we always like to say live in the present. I'm not big on living in the past, but it is an honor to say for at least two, three years of the Camel Series, I was one of the best players in the world at doing what I did for a living. 
And, you know, there's a lot of people that do real estate, whatever, play golf, whatever you do. And you can't say that you're one of the best in the world at what you do for a living, you know, what you do for your profession. So to be able to say I did that for my career, my early career, uh, that's something I always take to the grave. My daughter, you know, now gets to watch. She's 13. She gets to watch the videos of me play. Uh, and so she brags a little bit about her dad. You know, and she understands that, you know, what it means to be one of the best in the world. It's just unfortunate, guys. You know, obviously you guys love pool. That pool just doesn't pay, you know, what golf or what football or basketball or baseball paid. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time doing other things outside of the pool. And sometimes people come up to me and say, hey, man, like, you know, why are you in this club? I'm like, well, I, and I, I remember I just that's why I'm telling you this story. I remember I used to, my excuse was, well, if pool paid what golf paid, I'd be like Tiger, and I'd probably be doing what Tiger's doing now, and Tiger's probably hitting golf ball somewhere because he makes millions of dollars and he gets paid by Nike. But pool doesn't pay that. I know where I stand, so I'm going to have a good night tonight. And, you know, that's what it was. So, you know, I, I enjoyed pool. I, I'll never forget those years that will always have a special place in my heart, and I'm glad you guys have me on. Uh, I hope maybe I said some things today that gave somebody, you know, some tips to moving forward, whether it's playing the ghost, visualizing, uh, and definitely playing eight ball. Get rid of those trouble balls, guys, uh, immediately. Yep. Well, we appreciate the insight, man. We appreciate you joining us. Um, guys, if you enjoy content like this, please hit that thumbs up. Um, give us a like and leave us a comment below and let us know how we're doing. And we'll see y'all next time on the Pulling Around Show. Michael, thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thanks, guys. See you, Sean. What, see you, Chris. What an honor. I felt like I made a new friend. Cool. Thank you, man. See you. You guys have a good night. You too. You too. Good luck tonight. Thank you, bye.